probably the list of reasons that I got the visitation. I mean, it's very long because the truth is out there in so many different ways, and I try to support it in so many different ways. Having a president who calls himself Catholic and pushing the atrocity of abortion, that's wrong in so many ways. We should be roaring, stop this. So I hope you watched part one of our interview with Bishop Joseph Strickland of Tyler, Texas. And again, we were so very blessed to be there. If you haven't watched part one, go do that right now. But if you have, this second part of the interview is really interesting because the big question on everyone's mind is, if this bishop is so successful, such that he has the highest rate of seminarians and ordinations of the whole country per capita. In fact, if you had some of the bigger dioceses like Chicago, they should have tens of thousands of seminarians, tens of thousands of ordinations per year, but they don't, of course. Um, so there's a big problem here, big disconnect. Why is the Vatican doing a visitation, which is a disciplinary measure meant to offer censure. Why is that happening to Bishop Strickland? There's a letter from the faithful in the diocese that was published at the Remnant and at LifeSite News and other places about the grave scandal that this is causing. What is scandal? Scandal is being taken into a sin. And what is the problem here is that Bishop Strickland is upholding the constant teaching of the church that we've had for 2,000 years. He's outspokenly defending it when many other bishops are flouting it totally going against it openly. Those same bishops are being named cardinals, are giving huge spots in the Vatican and, and, and huge clout in the church. And yet Bishop Strickland, for defending the faith, with all of the great things you might expect from a bishop, like their finances are doing well, their ordinations are doing well, their the, the religious life is doing well. Why is he getting a visitation and not the others? Well, we've asked that question of Bishop Strickland himself. And on this second part of the interview with Bishop Strickland, you'll hear it from the horse's own mouth. Stay tuned to this episode of the John Henry Weston Show. Hey, my friends, now is the time to stand up and fight. We are just about to have the Synod on Synodality, and everything that you've seen indicates that it's going to be an absolute disaster. We have Father James Martin as a personal appointee of the Pope speaking at it. We've got Cardinal Supich, Cardinal Tobin, these picks of the Pope to engage in this synod are indicative of where we're going. We're going into heresy. And at these times of great crisis, the church, especially those called in the laity to work for the glory of Christ and his church, are called to gather and strategize. Back in 2014, LifeSite launched something called Rome Life Forum. It was a gathering at that point of some 75 life and family leaders from all around the world to strategize as to what we could do. And when we gathered, the majority of people were most concerned about what? About Pope Francis, about what was going on in Rome. But this was 2014, but the life and family leaders saw it first. Now, a decade on, we are confronted with some of the most severe challenges the church has ever faced. And so our tradition at LifeSite is to continue with Rome Life Forum, which has continued every year until we had to take a break over COVID because we weren't permitted, but we're starting it up again. Please come, if you feel so called, to Rome, October 31st and November 1st, the very end of the Synod on Synodality, and uh, we'll be there to strategize with His Eminence, with His Excellency, and with many life and family leaders from around the world. For LifeSite News, this is John Henry Weston, and may God bless you. You have experienced something that's a great shock, because there are, <clears throat> by what I've been told and, and can see evidence of, there's been 400 or so families that have moved to Tyler uh, because of uh, Bishop Strickland is here. <laughs> Hopefully because of Jesus Christ. Yeah, but he kind of, our Lord kind of emanates from you in, in a kind of a special way. And they're wanting to move here because they see a vibrancy of faith in yourself and in those you have attracted to the diocese. Um, we are here to cover the beautiful final vows of Mother Miriam, a nun who formed her order with Cardinal Burke 
and then was restricted by several bishops from being able even to complete her final vows. She had postulants who were there at the time and uh, they were told to leave. Uh, there was only one sister who had uh, professed and, and been clothed and she was able to stay. She stayed with her for the last decade or so, but also unable to make even vows. And uh, it's been a sad journey for her and you know, she's an outspoken, does the daily show. She's, in, in my estimation, she's the new Mother Angelica who, you know, really, in a very similar way, her show is the <laughs> uh, Mother Miriam Live, uh, right after uh, Mother Angelica's. And so these kinds of things have happened in, in the church at large where really, I want to say, holy Catholics have come for refuge here. Um, and that, in turn, has attracted others and, and made for a beautiful, a vibrant faith in the middle of, what do you, what do you call it, the, the buckle of the Bible Belt, um, you know, the Vatican of, uh, of the uh, kind of Protestant movement here in America, and yet it, it's here. It, that's beautiful all by itself, but how come you see this, and there's, there's many, many in the Episcopacy who don't seem to? How come you can see what's going on in the church at large and speak to it, whereas almost all your confrères are silent? Having, basically in the English-speaking world, there's only two bishops that I know of that are speaking loudly to the culture. Bishop Athanasius Schneider, who's already in, uh, you know, in Siberia so they can't send him any further away, and then yourself. How do you get it? in that sense, and everybody doesn't. Well, John Henry, I, I think that is the million dollar question. Um, I don't know that I have the answer. Uh, it, I'm mystified that me, you know, a kid from, you know, outside Atlanta, Texas, uh, why me and, and how me, but really having said that, the answer is very clear to why I know this truth, because I know him. <laughs> I know Jesus Christ, and through prayer, and it's not because of me at all. It really isn't. Uh, part of my prayer at every Mass is, I'm nothing. You're everything. Um, and that that's the reality. I don't have any super gift of anything. I'm not sort of some, you know, special gift he is and i guess the gift that i have received is knowing christ and you know really it's interesting as as we talk the the sanctity of the life of the unborn is the human issue for us i, I truly believe there's everything leads back to that for the church you could say the divine issue is the Eucharist, the Eucharistic presence of Christ. He's here because he promised he would be. He's here to strengthen us as those who came from God and need to keep that connection. I mean, how better connected than an actual concrete, yes, it's, I mean, it's challenging for all of us to, to pray before what appears to the world and even to us. I mean, it looks like just a, a flat, round piece of bread. Very uninteresting, you know, in terms of the world and all the pizzazz the world wants. But he's really there. He's really present. And that's the tragedy, spiritually speaking, of the church. Both are, uh, you know, it's hard to say which is more tragic, the, the lack of respect for the sanctity of life or the lack of belief in the real presence. But for us as Catholics, they're, they're two linchpins of, of living our faith, of living what God is calling us to do. And you know, to answer your question, why me? You look at Scripture, you look at so many examples, you look at the 12 apostles. I mean, God chooses the unlikely, little, meaningless, forgotten, of the world, God says, I'm gonna use this one. And you know, that's, that's sort of a scary <laughs> acknowledgement, but 
you know, and I'm a very, you know, frail and broken and weak instrument, but I feel God using me. Um, and I qualify as, as nothing, you know, God takes nothing and makes something out of it through his grace. But that's the reason. Um, that's the strength I have is spending time with Christ in, in what I've come to call his Eucharistic face that comes from various spiritual reading that I've done that speaks in that way. And that's, that's something that I didn't always have that. But I think it's, it speaks of an intimacy that we need to continue to try to deepen. A, a Eucharistic face really starts to, for me, transform that time in prayer in his presence to really believe and to know that the same Christ that we read about in the Gospels, the same Jesus who died on the cross, he's right there. And you can talk to him about what was it really like in Gethsemane. And I mean, to me, praying the rosary and the Eucharistic adoration are, that's what the world needs to do in this. I mean, we talk about issues in the church and they're, they're devastating for us as people of faith that there's so much lack of faith and this, the horizontal is just taken over. Um, but for the world, you know, we need to recognize we come from God and the best way to get reconnected to him is through God, through his son. And he's with us. He's here. He's down the hall. And we're going to go spend some time with him after we talk. That is what that's you ask the question, how come? And I'm sure that. Bishop Athanasius Schneider would say the same thing. We've had a chance to talk a couple of times and, and we kind of laugh about it. I mean, God has a sense of humor and he does choose the forgotten. I mean, like you said, he's already in Siberia. I, you know, this minus, this would be the, it's a beautiful place, in Tyler, Texas. But as far as, you know, some place to, you know, if I need to be sent somewhere as, as a punishment, I mean, this is where you'd be sent. So I'm already here. Um, but why the two of us? I don't know. But that is probably one of the most frequent questions that I get is why? Why are you speaking up? And, and there are plenty of people that say I shouldn't be. Even right here in Tyler, we wish he would just shut up. He's just so disruptive to things. But I feel compelled. I mean, I, I read St. Paul in, in his writings, and I truly feel compelled to do this, not because I'm worthy of it, not because I'm the best instrument, but because I know the truth, and it, it's glorious, it's beautiful, it's joyful, it's life-giving. It's not some... It, the truth is spoken of, I mean, at least if you think of dogma and doctrine and the, the solid teachings of our faith, that truly does set us free. It's spoken of by people high in the church as, as if it was horrible shackles and diminishing our abilities to, to live in the human community. Get rid of this dogma, this doctrine, these teachings. That's devastating. And the beauty of who we are as people of God, as children of God, has been defined and clarified and revealed to us through those teachings. Yes, they're challenging. But as Pope Benedict the, the 16th says, one of my favorite quotes of his, we're not made for comfort. We're made for greatness. And to me, that speaks of everything I've said about that newly conceived child, which both of us were not that long ago, really. I mean, we've lived a life. I'm 64 years old. But 64 years ago, I started with a potential from God that, you know, I'm a sinner. I've messed up certainly along the way, but I've done my best to fulfill what is God's will. And that's what we all need to be looking for. Father, what is your will for me? Christ models that for us. And we're so far away from that in our culture and sadly, even in the church. You know, I, I can't quit speaking of the beauty of what God calls us to. 
With all that's going on in the world and the church today, it's actually critical for us to devote time to prayer and retreat as our Lord did in the Gospels. Now, there are perhaps few better ways to do so than to take a pilgrimage and follow in the very footsteps of Jesus Christ himself on a journey through the Holy Land. LifeSite News is proudly sponsored by the Franciscan Foundation of the Holy Land, which is now offering a rare opportunity to elevate your faith. Join Father Peter F. Vasco, a Franciscan priest and native to the region for nearly 40 years, as he guides you through the heart of the Holy Land on a 10-day tour through Israel. Watch the Bible come to life as you visit sacred holy sites, walk the ancient streets of Jerusalem, visit the Nativity Church built over the grotto of Jesus' birth, pray in the upper room at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and much, much more. For information on this outstanding opportunity, visit the Franciscan Foundation for the Holy Land at www.ffhl.org. That's www.ffhl.org. Or call 855-500-3345. That's 855-500-3345. And now, back to the program. When I was speaking with a friend of yours who uh, helps you a lot, Rich, he was talking to me about you and about... I asked him the question too, and he told me something that, for me, totally answered the question. He talked about your adorations before Mass that sometimes last like up to two hours, um, and you just <coughs> kneel there before our Lord exposed in the Blessed Sacrament. And I was like, oh, of course. That's, that's why. You, you soak in him, and you're before him. How in the world did you think to do that? Right. As a layman, if, if I dream of being a priest, you administer to people, you do all sorts of things, but, and you offer the Holy Sacrifice, which is unthinkably beautiful, but that ability to <laughs> reach our Lord in the tabernacle, bring him out and talk to him, literally face to face, and to just to, um, that's incredible. But, you're one of the few people I know who take real huge advantage of that. How did you get to that? That's a beautiful thing. I really don't know the, the total answer, but I do know very clearly, just chronologically and just spiritually, and it's not going to surprise you at all, it started with his mother. It started with Mary. And... You know, as a Catholic kid, I was bo born into and raised in a Catholic family. Uh, I call myself a deep vert, if anything. I didn't revert. I'm not a convert. I've always been Catholic, but I've gone deeper and deeper, especially since I've been a bishop. But so I always pray the rosary. But really, and I, I, I'm not, I know it's been since I've been a bishop. Uh, I really believe that, that, anointing, I mean, which we believe. I mean, it's the fullness of holy orders. We have all this beautiful theology, and I feel like I've, I'm living it, you know, that it changed me. It, it deepened the, the faith in me, and one of the first signs of that, you could say, was a deeper engagement in praying the rosary. You know, as a Catholic kid, I knew how to pray the rosary, and I'd pray the rosary, and, you know, as rector of the cathedral for 16 years, Countless funerals, you know, pray a rosary. That's the tradition here is you, a rosary the night before. And, um, and it's interesting, even where, as we're talking, you know, because, you know, this doesn't happen overnight. I mean, you know, unlike St. Paul, I didn't get knocked down by a bolt of light, uh, but it's just a gradual process. And even talking about the rosary, um, I hadn't really even thought of this before, but praying the rosary, which is our tradition, before the night before a funeral, which I've done countless funerals for wonderful people through 16 years as assistant and then as rector of the cathedral. Um, but I developed a rosary prayer that really, it's very interesting because I hadn't put it all together in, until right now. But because the way I look at the rosary, the way I pray the rosary is the journey through Christ's life. And I'm sure it's not rocket science. A lot of people do that. But it, it's become a, a deep part of the rosary for me. The first, you know, joyful mystery, the, the conception, the annunciation of that's what's being announced 
is Jesus is conceived in the womb all the way through till the last glorious mystery where the woman whose womb he was conceived in is what we're celebrating today, the fifth glorious mystery, the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, or the fourth glorious mystery, the assumption of Mary, that I began praying those rosaries before, you know, uh, the night before a funeral, just five decades, but I would take a joyful mystery, a sorrowful mystery, a luminous mystery, a glorious, because that's life. We have joyful, we have sorrowful, we have glorious, we have luminous, and we have a lot of just ordinary, you know. But that's what I began to do. And I realize now, just as we're talking, that that's what really just expanded, you know, exponentially in my own spiritual journey as I pray the rosary. I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, and I, I pray the rosary in a lot of different ways now. Sometimes I can, you know, it, it just sort of wherever the Spirit moves me, and I pray the rosary a lot of times in the presence of the the Eucharist and in, in Eucharistic adoration. But um, sometimes I'll just continue to reflect on just one mystery and just keep, you know, praying the decades, but just stay with the one mystery. And it's gone so far beyond, you know, the typical when you do a rosary together. I mean, I'm sure I'd drive people crazy if I started going off into my own reflections, but you just say, the Annunciation, and then you pray the Our Father. I, I can stay with the Annunciation for a whole rosary or beyond. And I love to also weave in, I mean, the devotion to the Sacred Heart is deeply significant to me ever since, you know, as a child. Um, and it's just continued to grow as well. I love to think of where is Christ's sacred heart in each of those mysteries. So those kind of things. And I think it that it the conversation, you know, continues because as I grow closer to him, then I see him more clearly. And then as I see him more clearly, I grow closer. So it, it's just a beautiful sort of conversation with the Lord that it all is. I mean, reading the Gospels, I'm, I'm going through the um, Bible in a year right now that's actually published by the Augustine Institute, the version that's, you know, not recorded, but just an actual book you read. I, I'm a couple of days behind right now because it's been busy. But, you know, there's a, for like today is the, the 15th of August. There are readings for the 15th of August. And I've loved to, to you know, the way this is put together Old Testament readings and New Testament. I just started the book of Judith, and we're reading through the letters of Paul. And it, you know, the, there are just so many connections there, and you see so much more clearly how the journey of the people of Israel is is our ancestry, and we are the new Israel, continuing to live that. So it just you know, sort of keeps growing from there. And honestly, I forget what your question was, but hopefully, I'm answering it. Hello, friends. To celebrate the momentous overturning of Roe v. Wade, we at LifeSite have minted just under 10,000 of these brand new limited edition pro-life silver rounds. Now, each round is stamped with the image of the Supreme Court of the United States featuring the date that the High Court delivered this historic victory. And on the front of our pure silver rounds, LifeSite's logo surrounded by a brilliant sunburst and draped with olive branches. They, of course, commemorate our 25-year anniversary of LifeSite News. We began in 1997 in September, so September of 2022 was 25 years. These one ounce silver rounds are available from our partners at stjosephspartners.com where you can fulfill all of your silver and gold needs in this perilous time. May God bless you. One of the things where we started talking was about the visitation that happened uh, to you. And it was shocking to a lot of people in, in that the powers that be might say would dare to do that because you are a beloved bishop. There and not only by your diocese, there are, because you've been given the gift by our Lord, as, as you say, and I, I totally believe that, to, to speak the truth in a time of real, real silence. Not only even America, actually in almost all the world. Uh, it's a very strange time of, of silence from the voices that should speak. You know, the one who, was, who should have spoken remained silent is, is one of the passages that I've read over and over again. And so your visitation was kind of expected by some, like, yep, that figures. And there was a great concern, oh, will he be canceled? Two questions for you. Why do you think there was a visitation? 
uh, to you. And um, what would that mean? You haven't stopped speaking since the visitation. And uh, what are your uh, thoughts about being canceled? Why did it happen? I think it goes back to what we, one of the earlier things we've talked about just now is I'm looking up. I'm looking, I'm looking up and I'm looking to the, the deposit of faith, the, the, the beautiful and ancient truth that stretches back for 2,000 years, really. I mean, you know, not fully formed and, I, you know, people throw, you know, rocks at me saying, oh, well, this has only been for this century. But all of that is just noise. We have a beautiful treasure of truth. And I keep pointing to it. Um, that, sadly, is in conflict with the, the tone of the horizontal look at things. I mean, frankly, I mean, there are probably many reasons. I mean, you could sort of, I mean, the, the strong sort of um, being so outspoken about the sanctity of life. I mean, which, you know, I mean, the church, thankfully, still says life from conception to natural death. But politically speaking, I mean, everything's politicized these days, but speaking out too much on that and saying things like having a president who calls himself Catholic and pushing the atrocity of abortion, that's just, that's wrong in so many ways. We should be roaring, stop this. Either, you know, something's got to be, I mean, I pray for the man, but there needs to be a conversion or there needs to be a clean statement that he's, he's not Catholic. He's not of the Catholic spirit or mindset. You know, so, I mean, probably the list of reasons that I got the visitation, I mean, it's very long because the truth is out there in so many different ways, and I try to support it in so many different ways. I mean, the things with mandating the vaccine, I'm sure that that was a, another check mark. Oh, we got to check on this guy. How can we mandate erasing people's free will? Talk about forgetting who we're connected to. I mean, that is one of the deepest connections that, and thankfully, you know, even our society hasn't developed a way to get into your heart and mind and tell you, no, you can't believe that. I'm sure there are, there are many that would love to develop that ability to, tell, to take away our free will. But mandates, to me, we can't mandate things against people's free will. And that was going on. I, you know, I mean, there were people that were very upset with me for speaking out against, you know, vaccines and medical treatments that are being proven, and people aren't paying much attention that I can see, but they're being proven to be not very helpful, if not deeply damaging to human life. And so, like I said, <laughs> I think there are many reasons, because I do speak out, and I feel compelled to, as I said earlier. I think that in many ways, it's like I'm the opposite of what is the accepted norm. Stay quiet, keep your head down, just be part of this conference of bishops or this group, and don't say anything individually. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm Bishop of Tyler. Where is that? Who is he? I'm sure that question is asked all the time, but I'm a successor of the apostles. And, and I think that that is a disconnect that, you know, I don't want to judge anyone else. I, I mean, I'm concerned about my own judgment and doing my best to live out a mandate that I've been given. But when you think about being a successor of the apostles, it's very different than being part of a, a conference of bishops or being part of this group or, you know, sort of operating in the, the more corporate structure that the church has. A successor of the apostles, you look back to the original apostles, for one thing, they died. <laughs> but they died joyfully and clearly proclaiming the truth. And so if that's what gets you an investigation uh, or a visitation, okay, then, yeah, I'll be 
I'll be visited because I feel compelled to speak out. And as far as actually being canceled, um, as I've said before, I, I don't know. I mean, I know very little, really. I know the conversation I had with the two bishops that came and spoke to a lot of people here. Um, but I don't know what happens next, when what happens next, if something happens, I don't know. Um, but I try to just continue to do my job and to to teach the truth. And no, I, I haven't been silenced. I, I can't see any way that I can cease to speak the truth um, as Bishop of Tyler or not as Bishop of Tyler. I, it's just a man of faith. If you know the truth, I believe you, you have to share it, and, and certainly with respect and, and everything. But one thing that has been clear for me, I pray for the day when I fade back into obscurity because I'm just saying what every bishop's saying, and everyone's saying it very clearly. And so, you know, I don't have the, the greatest, clearest voice but when no one's saying it, people pay attention. I, I pray for the day when, you know, people forget who Bishop Strickland was because every bishop in the world is saying, look to the heavens, look to God, be your highest self, believe this truth that's been revealed to us. But as long as others aren't speaking, okay, people are going to listen that want the truth because I'm going to keep speaking. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know what comes next, but, you know, the, because people are worried about me. My family's worried about me. It's one of the most peaceful times in my life in 64 years. Um, I, I have a lot of questions, but in, in the strength and the peace uh, the only thing I can point to, of course, is Christ and spending time with him. But knowing you're speaking the truth, it really does set you free. I don't have to remember what I said a month ago and say, okay, you got to keep, uh, keep the story straight. You just speak the truth. It's always the truth. It doesn't change. I don't care who tells us it changes. That's ridiculous, really. We deepen our understanding of the truth, but... God is truth in being. I mean, God is the great I am. He is truth. His son is truth incarnate. It doesn't change. We are the ones that need to change. And, and I think that that's sadly where the church is. We're trying to, we, I say, as a church, there's a real movement to make the church, make ourselves in our own image instead of realizing we're made in the image and likeness of God. And that is a dangerous path. And a lot of what the turmoil and the fracturing and the brokenness you see in families and individuals with young, I mean, just across society, it's rooted in forgetting who we are, forgetting that we are of God. And trying to play God ourselves, we really mess it up. Amen to that. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Hi, everyone. This is John Henry Weston. We hope you enjoyed this program. To see more like it, be sure to hit the subscribe button below to get all the latest content from LifeSite News. Check the links in the description to read more and connect with us on social media so that you can stay up to date with all the latest life, family, faith, and freedom news. Thanks for watching, and may God bless you.